Welcome back, fellow armchair generals. This is Gamer1745 here with my continuing playthrough of Hearts of Iron 3 with Black Eyes 9. And yes, we're still playing as Germany. Okay. Let's continue this. Up the speed a bit. And we've already got our first thing to deal with. Okay, combined arms. Allows us to research that. And, um, okay, yeah. Well, right now we were one over, so. Do that, command and control, advance. No, oh, we want to go up one more. No, not two more. Quick, but not too quick. So let's see, can we sell more to the U.S. of A? More supplies. Clockwise, yes, we can. So, install our technology. I know we still have a lot of spies, and some of them are doing counter spy operations. Uh, Netherlands, we give them money for crude oil. No, we'll just steal your crude oil later when we conquer you. The U.S. of A, we give them money for crude oil. No, yeah, we're doing okay. As you can see, yeah. Yeah, well, maybe we should be building up a bigger stockpile. No, I'll consider that next time. But I'm very, as you can tell, sort of strategic. Um, by it. During peacetime, it's fairly good to buy it from the US across the Atlantic and nations like the Netherlands who gets a lot from Indonesia um, they stockpile it in the net you know here at home in the Netherlands and we can just go get it with our pan panzers later on so we might as well you know if we want to buy and stockpile buy and stockpile from somebody like the US or Venezuela or way out somewhere way out there like that oh, we need more of these guys You know, way out there like that. We want a big overproduction. And then once we can no longer, um, you know, trade out there um, without having losses um, to the enemy, we can then trade from the Soviet Union. As well as plunder conquered countries so okay fire control solutions have advanced for our light vessels um, well, we'll stop that one to 37 and we're still in 36 I think we have more important 37 techs. Even some of those are more important, especially that cut stuff. If we're going to do pushing ahead, which we are already, obviously. Um, these we are fully done with currently. Okay. Um, hmm. Yeah, let's come over here. Do that. So we're still at 241 with all of our ups, downs. You can see like the Pioneer program down 3%. Building air bases in West Prussia. That'll go away eh, fairly soonish. Sooner than the Pioneer program will, that's for sure. So that will get us, you know, 5% there. Where Crest system, level 1, 1%. That's going to be basically with us through the rest of the game, a cost. Um... So we can just, you know, that's just, you're, you, you're going to be getting a bunch of um, units by events. A lot of them aren't good units, necessarily, um, or whatnot, but they are good for reserve, you know, if things start going bad, or if you want to, um, uh, we can do defensive positions. 
um, or if you want to use them as occupational type forces. Now, it's sort of an old thought, um, and this is generally speaking from battles that were, um, you know, everybody's fighting in a battle. Basically, if you get on top of even just a minor hill, you can see the whole battle kind of thing. But it holds true in, um, we would give them fuel for money. Okay. Um, it holds true for um, str strategic things as well as larger battles. The side that um, uh, still has reserves, you know, the, the first person to throw all of his reserves into battle is normally the person who's going to lose it. Well, that was short term. Is going to be losing it. Obviously, if you see an opening, you know, oh, we can flank the enemy or whatever, and then you just decide to throw all your reserves into the battle. Alexander the Great did that a few times, though I think a few times it may have been sort of a desperation move. He sort of got stuck into things and was a brilliant general and got out because of that. But, um, you know, so yes, it can be even in, you know, an 18th century kind of thing. You can see an opening and decide to throw in your reserves while the enemy still has reserves. Now, but that has to be a killing blow. Otherwise, because if the enemy still has their reserves, they'll just send them in to stabilize the situation, turn it around, and, um, you know, on you, and you don't have any new reserves to deal with it. So, so the idea that if we maintain a lot of these reserve units in Germany, the AI probably won't. Basic tank ammunition, yes, all of these things are all up by, well, some of them by six. Well, most of them look, well, well there's some eight. But that's, you know, heavy and various ones. But a lot of force. So that's a really good basic tank ammunition is up there. And the kinds of things, and I know a lot of you guys are already, you're, you're going, hey, gamer, I'm already with you on, all, you know, all this um, great detail. But what I really try to argue and what others that think um, simplicity is better because... Um, you're trying to get to the critical factors and not just all the other contributing factors. Um, so, you know, why why worry about uh, making uniforms? We just worry about making rifles or something like that in sort of Hearts of Iron 4. Well, um, what I think, and, and I like these type of things, is, is um, not everybody could make basic um, any tank ammunition. And basic anti-tank ammunition is more than um, just simply a solid shot going down range. It's, you know, with some of these things, high-density alloys or other sorts of things that make it a, a tempered round with a uh, very hard tip for penetrating armor. And, um, I don't know, um, Denmark or maybe Hungary, and I don't know, you know, really didn't have factories set up to make those particularly hardened uh, anti-tank rounds so they just didn't have that ability and that's what so even though um, Hungary makes tanks what is it the Toldi um, you know are they making really good tank ammunition or are they buying it from Germany you know um, so that's what makes Hungary different than Germany even more so than just simply the size and that's a way and then and a lot of these people and I will agree with them Maybe the big difference, maybe the differences aren't so huge between Germany and Austria, but those differences are huge once you start getting out here. And, you know, China's ability to make super good steel, even Japan is having some difficulty. Now, they made some duraluminum, really good aluminum, better than the Americans made that they later once, by the end of the, after the war, they copied. You know, they, you know so Japan isn't behind on everything, but they're not up equally on everything either. So, um, you know, that sort of shows some of the difference, differences. And they're incremental in places, but they're also sort of fundamental. Okay, and the reason I paused is because I wanted to... while talking, but... Okay, let's do more um, naval power research. Get these guys. 
No, I'm giving them money for crude oil. Mm, no, we're looking more to do overseas right now, if we're going to do some of that. So I really do like that sort of a lot of little things adding up that make first tier nations different than third tier nations or fifth tier nations or whatever. You know, whether you just want to do a partisan effect or you want to um, constantly like some events constantly spring up partisan units. Yeah, you can make Afghanistan hell to occupy. And if they sort of come into some of these mountainous, um, well, I don't know, for some reason it's desert, but well, these are, should, well, um, okay, well, there's some, some of these, there, this, this, this area here is, um, uh, well, the Khyber Pass and all that, I, well, I would have made these more hillier, I don't know, but, um, as opposed to flat plains, but, um, I'm not on the ground there, but, um, the northwest frontier area here is pretty rugged, um, but why Afghanistan would never be because the tribesmen and you may have seen some of the pictures of their sort of even modern day making ha re decent handmade copies but few at a time are never going to overrun the major urban areas down here so they might defend themselves but they aren't going to be the type that are going to overrun everything else okay form this famous yes we're paying for that in a way already should I put it in the Oh, we got oh, we got air bases. We need to move up. Okay, get those up there. They'll flash in. Okay, they'll flash in. Um, yeah, we'll just quickly see how fast I can tap the mouse button. Which will take forever, especially since I'm not building them. But we'll put those to get them. Oh, we're gonna move up other stuff, but these should increase our practicals in minor, minor ways. Wait for the day to come. I should check that better because it's been a little while since we've had that West Prussia air bases. See it? They all popped up. Right. Okay. Um, the shift bio bio or shift bio technic technisch Gesellschaft. STG, the Society for Marine Technology, needs to change its um, status to, uh, in several points, um, including a notice on necessary Aryan descent for membership. Um, this year, Doctor Professor of, or Professor Doctor of Engineering, George um, Schnedel, I believe that's him. I made the event. I'm pretty sure that's him. Receives the silver medal for the Society for his contribution to. Ship resistance. Um, Schned, Schnedal, Schnedal, sorry, was the first to apply the general elasticity theory to examples of ship resistance and argued about the company. And this is what I get from doing Google Translate of German sites and trying to make it make sense as best I can. The annual general meeting will be held with the um, participation of much political prominence participation of much political yeah like I say I again I need a good editor um, should we continue support for the society okay well this is the building of the society this is one of their sort of they were sort of doing a Viking motif with the swastika there and that's who is getting the thing and I was sort of Google translating and trying to make it make sense um, so this a um, lot of sort of armor and um, uh, hull type gain for streamlining different submarines and things so we get that but as you notice they're all minor so unless you're you can decide not to do it and spend don't spend the supplies but we're gonna so unless you're actively going to research all these things you know they're not gonna help you we're gonna do it because it costed very little and um, yeah, we may do some research in some of those things and it'll help out okay and it pushed us over, I think, somewhere, light cruiser hole. So then it um, will do that. And it won't pop up when it's happened. So we got... Um, I 
39 so like or like cruiser armor okay so that did help us a little bit on something we were actively researching okay silver medal for sculpture they used to give out prior to world war ii and this was the last olympics prior to world war ii but it wasn't unique to germany um gold silver and bronze medal for other sort of things than just sporting events in and around the olympics and this is arno becker wins the silver medal for his sculptures in the 1936 summer olympics art exhibition in 1936 he won the the commission for two sculptures representing um, athletic prowess intended for the 1936 olympic games in berlin one representing um decathlete and the other uh, the victorious male and female um statues basically um, that he specifically did for this, um, the Berlin Olympics, and we'll hear more from Arno Becker, Becker later. And, okay, this is the, um, sort of decision point. That was a graphic I sort of got, and in my early days, it could be a lot better. I wouldn't make that today, but, um, I put the two elements, the, the flag on top of the Swiss country. That's supposedly were all the different Nazi different headquarters though I noticed a bunch down here so I think it's also fascist and those are probably fascist over there um, some modern um, anti and this I did get this from an anti-Nazi website um, conflate fascism with Nazism with the deaths of Wilhelm Gustloff our influence has waned in Switzerland do we want to support the National Front um, Yes, this is if you want to continue to support, and there will be some other um, choices, but if you don't want to hear basically any more about Swiss Nazis because you're not planning on invading Switzerland and you're not planning on doing anything about that, um, hit no. You know, if you're going to leave Switzerland alone, just let it go. Um, or you or you don't want the immersion events or the costs so but if you want to do that this is the decision point Swiss Nazis we're gonna support them um, Mussolini has a chance um, of supporting you know it's a I don't know 70 30 60 40 I, I don't know I don't remember what I code but to and if he supports them if he chooses to uh, and if the access gets Switzerland he'll get a couple of provinces unfortunately for this game purposes basically the provinces have no real use now what i will say is i'm planning on invading switzerland this time maybe a bunch of people are going to jump up yay yay and shout because often you say you ought to invade you ought to invade and normally they go oh why and, and and i'm still leery about it and i may not but i'm sort of planning on invading because those i'm presuming if we don't we're going to lose um where is it here um Well, um, let's see, um, uh, distribution here. Um, we will lose, um, again, we're, oh, BS2, B, or IBS 2000, that's the International Bank of Settlement. I presume we're going to lose that if we invade Switzerland. That has always been, uh, I will admit the main reason is just because they didn't do it historically. So I haven't felt the need to, and Switzerland never does anything um, to attack me. So why bother? And it's normally not any good invasion route for me to go either into um, France or whatever. The main reason I'm considering, and I'm sort of planning on it at the moment, but I may talk myself out of it, um, is... Um, Italy feels like it needs to super guard the border against Switzerland. So Italy puts a lot of divisions up here. Especially once, you know, all the rest of the Mediterranean is sort of taken and not be aggressive in other places. So that is my biggest reason. If we take it, um, Italy won't um, invade or, or won't um, defend the border um, against it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I will admit that I've never really read any of his works. I've read writings about him, um, you know, multiple page, you know, informational stuff, but I've never actually read his stuff. Um, uh, August 1936, Bonhoeffer's authorization to teach at the University of Berlin was revoked 
after he den was denounced as a pacifist and enemy of the state. Uh, Bonhoeffer was a dissident anti-Nazi and author of The Cost of um, Discipleship. And he is a, um, a Christian resistance person, not a resistance as in shooting, but as in a, um, operating against the Nazis. Eventually he goes to work for um, Wilhelm Canaris, and Canaris protects him up until basically he's done, you know, in the post-July um, plot against Hitler. Um, Bonhoeffer's killed at that point, or some point after that as well. Okay, the um, this is the um, there's the full cover. I sort of chopped it up to highlight it. Um, the Energy Magazine for the Olympics. Yes, I made a bunch of stuff around the Olympics. I really haven't covered the Olympics directly. That's just going to be a big oh, I don't know, ten to fifty events someday when I when I get around to it. New industrial zones ready because I'll you know I'll go into um, Probably make them several event change. Who's winning what? Um, what sporting events uh, and that kind of thing. And Jesse Owens wins and so and so doesn't. And there won't be any randomness to it because we don't really have, um, from our level, the ability to make decisions. Who do we put in to play the football game or something? Obviously, I know that's World Cup, but whatever it might be for the Olympics. Um, well, let's start on aero engines here. I know we still have a few more here to do, but. So that would just simply be a really good. And I've got, I've even made a few event images. I've got other stuff um, dealing with um, the, um, you know, the SA sporting stuff and various Nazi stuff. So there's a lot of Nazi immersion in it. Um, for try to give got, it again my whole idea would be and I would love if they would for Hearts of Iron 4 and I poked them and I'm going to poke them again I'm sure if they would allow this to become an animated also be an animated GIF format because you can like have Jesse Rowan's running or beating, winning the race or you know just quick five second thing that you know either loop or just go on once probably because they might pop up loop I love that um, but it would be a whole immersion thing of what it was like to be in Berlin, so because I've collected um, color photos of you know the flag line streets and all this, what it would be like to be in Berlin for the Olympics, and it was a big show and, and through the whole thing, and so it would be an impressive event chain, and it would be really immersive. And yes, I would make it so that if you know once you've seen it once or twenty-five times and you're tired of it, a few quick outs, yeah, good, go on. You know if you don't want to step through it every time and so and i know a lot of you guys you like all the immersion you're going to play it because you're watching my channel but a lot of other people out there might not like that immersion and and slowing up the game that much they have the abilities to opt out at at um time, times okay henlein and hitler there they are together um the state and deutsches party leader conrad henlein has come to berlin to meet with hitler and the national social leaders to seek support for the sdp we must decide the important question of the Germans living in Czechoslovakia. Should we support the German-speaking areas join, uh, joining the Reich or leave Czechoslovakia in peace? Those are key things. This will have long-term ramifications for the future. And I try to make try to make this clear without maybe hitting you over the head at the hammer even more. Support the um, SDP or stay out of Czech affairs. You stay out of Czech affairs, you aren't going to get the Sudeten events, you know, to get there. You can invade them. You know, you can invade Czechoslovakia once, you know, you're allowed to. And go in there and invade and take it. But you can't, um, you won't get the semi-peaceful um, possibility. There's still a possibility you could go to war. We're going to, of course, take that. But just so that you know. Okay, um, build air bases, yes. So that happened there. So what we're going to do is come here and check this out immediately. More air bases. Yeah. Now, World Cup. Um, World Cup of 42. Since we have not received the World Cup, the National Football Association has decided to compete. Um, com oh, okay. This is just um, to compete for the hosting of the World Cup um, in 1942. Again, um, of course... 
you don't want to tell somebody in 1936 um, that you're planning on having a world war in 42, so including your own people, you know, your own um, ministers and whatnot. And, but I would also um, very much argue that they weren't thinking there was going to be a war in um, 1940. And a lot of that comes um, to the idea that the 1940 Olympics was going to be in Tokyo. Well, they might do the winter part up somewhere else. And that was what it was going to be. But it was re removed um, only because of their bad behavior of invading, you know, China. And, you know, so that happens. And so then they looked around for a new um, venue. Well, Germany had um, that um, Garmisch um, Park Kin 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 Sun Son Son had a nice um, right there had a nice Winter Olympics stadium thing already built in '36, and everyone liked it in '36. So they were going to get the Winter Olympics in Finland and Helsinki. I think um, it was also a political decision to sort of like. We're having the big international political Olympics in 1940. This was decided in 38 or something or whatever. I forget exactly the year. There, I think there's some events covering it to, to, to reject Japan getting it. But it was sort of to say, hey, Finland's part of the, the Western world. Keep your hands off, Soviet Union. So, but at that point in 38 or 39 or whatever the exact... Um, year was um, they were Hitler Hitler and his Nazis were still enough of the party of community of nations even though they were sort of you know taking um, some territories around here that they were still planning on even with the taking of Czechoslovakia you know all of Czechoslovakia they were still planning on holding the Winter Olympics in Nazi Germany it was only the start of the war in Poland in 39 that put that to stop so, um, and, you know, that really to me shows that there weren't, they weren't planning that world, that to be a world war. Okay, um, so, let's see, we're going to lose threat on all, gain some popularity and lose a little money getting prepared for whatever. When, whereas we're competing for the World Cup in 42. Okay, we're playing nice. Everybody love us. We're really nice. We're cleaning up all the dirty street cities. St uh, dirty street. Uh, ah, dirty um, streets in the cities. Salt gliders. Okay. We were just doing that mostly to get that undone. Let's come over here and... Yeah, light bombers. Either that or start working on the fighters. Um, Der Essay Führer, this is a magazine, um, you know, on how to be a good essay leader kind of thing. There's some covers, that's the publisher, that's his publishing house, and a little information about it. So, gain, I sort of take a lot of these organizational events to sort of be more political, you know, the uh, National Socialist Party more politically organized, and depending on things, and a little bit maybe more popularity. So we can look here at politics. With all these different internal factors, when I've tested this out in Hearts of Iron 4, some of my first ones, and I've rejiggered this thing a few times, by this, well, by the end of 36, you're starting to get massive um, National Socialist support, and which is overdoing it. Because you can see here, we are still just 36 support. There's still, you know, a lot of other stuff. And obviously, we have not been having a lot of events that make the SDP or whatever popular. So, this all sort of helps and keeps, in my opinion, a historical balance. Okay. The Deutsche Sir Colonial Kriegersbund, the DKKB. Um, that is... So, oh. After, again, we've talked about how everything is national socialized in Germany. All organizations. And I have um, brochures and photographs from several gardening shows that all had to be you're, if you're going to do a gardening show and club it's going to have to be a national socialist club you can't have jews in your gardening club and i also have some stuff about chefs and chef events uh, you know like conventions um they all had to be national socialist um thing everything had to be a national socialist you weren't allowed to have um an organization 
that wasn't National Socialist. Now, saying all that, and that's quite true, but there are exceptions that are still National Socialist, but they sort of buck the trend. This is one of them. All of the um, World War I veterans organizations um, get um, put into the National Socialist Rights Warriors Association. Uh, Chris Hauser um, group. All of the, the stuff, because before this, well, this happened somewhat before this time, but I just having events in 36 here so you know what because you can do this but what happens is you know before 33 before before hitler comes to power you've got communist um veterans associations socialist um social you know more you know liberal democrat type people conservative you know you know german national type nationalist type you know that's want the return of kaiser the kaiser type you know have all these different veteran organizations they all either uh, simply entirely go away because, like, they're communists, or they merge all the members into one organization. The one exemption is Leto von Borbeck and the DKKB. Primarily, it was because these guys sort of had a bond in that their war was so different than, because there was a war down here, though that ended fairly quickly, and, of course, the really smaller ones disappeared fast, and even this war way out here... Um, sort of hung around for a while um, with the Germans playing guerrilla warfare games. And, of course, this um, lasted through to the end, and he marched into, you know, Portuguese, once Portugal went to war and territory and uh, there and surrendered only after Germany had quit the war. So they had this different, um, and because that's sort of hero status of all that, um, different element. Now, you will see pictures of these guys wearing swastika armbands and doing other things, but they sort of got to run themselves internally. They were technically part of the larger group, uh, the um, NSRK, uh, and they, no, more than technically, they were part of it, but they got to run themselves internally. So um, it was sort of, and he was sort of the leading figure, and of course he was very much an anti-Nazi. So they sort of kept to some degree an anti-Nazi um, group. We can support them, or we cannot. And this I look at as more as if you support them, um, you'll have, this is part of the element, not the only part, but part of the element to get eventually um, cores and other things down here in Tanganyika. So we're going to do that. That's sort of the decision point, or at least one of them. There's another one, or another couple coming up. But you don't get some of the other ones. You can opt out of some of the other ones. Okay, here's... Um, Black Ice's Summer Olympics. Um, uh, Summer Olympics, officially known as Olympia, Germany. It's 33 gold medals. Gets shown up that the Aryan race isn't some sort of super race, especially by Jesse Owen and a bunch of other black athletes. Um, my understanding, because um, I've watched some documentaries, um, Including some about like a, uh, I think it was a rowing team from Northwest U.S. and that most of the U.S. athletes are white, um, but they're they definitely as an organization who gets picked is not done, um, and there are several Jews, um, uh, from you know on the American teams that do pretty well, so we can let the games begin, improve relations, lose some dissent. Lose supplies, obviously, running it, gain money. That's, um, I presume, the tourists coming in, spending foreign currency. Because like I talked before, Germany had this huge problem of foreign currency. We're going to get foreign currency. If you could, you know, Germany could pay, and the German government could pay for as much as they wanted to, okay, um, as they wanted to for things. Um, you know, um, print money, build more tanks. Yes, at this time... You could have opened the factory up and build more tanks, build more tanks, build more tanks, and the German government can afford that. The only problem with that is, is sort of it, is this sort of it gets into um, uh, I'm blanking on it, um, Keynesian economics, and you're sort of priming the pump when you're having um, the government buy tanks, produce tanks for themselves. You have a worker 
who is building a tank, earning a good wage, and that tank is going into the government. That worker is now paid. But what is that worker going to buy with his money? Okay, and that will increase inflation. And so if the worker can't, because nobody wants rice marks outside of the country, he can't buy a French car because the French want francs or, you know, whatever, or a radio made in France. So if all the factories are building tanks, machine guns, aircraft, and whatever else going on, and you're paying the guy well, but there's nothing for him to buy with his money. He's waving around, I got money, I got money, you know, uh, sell me something, whatever it may be, and there's not enough stuff of it, you get inflation. This is some of the problems with Keynesian economics. So you have this money. Now, see, if you're building cars, and not, you know, they were starting, and we'll see coming up with the Volkswagen, but if you're actually building cars, the people building cars can save up their money and buy a car. So they have something to spend their money on. So if they're um, making shoes, they can buy shoes. But if they're making boots that are going into the government and the shoemaker doesn't have the ability to buy boots because he's not a soldier or his ability to buy shoes or well you know so it goes up price goes up i'm going to get to my second point here in a minute so it goes up and the soldier himself who's getting paid he doesn't have to pay for his boots because the government's paying for it so what is he going to do with his money yeah he can buy beer and all these guys can buy beer so long as there's beer for sale and so there's you know some consumables you can buy it on but it drives the prices up so this is why during you get during the war including in the u.s the u.s had rubber problems definitely had rubber problems it was ration uh, the rationing for for rubber was real and that is also why they rationed gasoline um in the u.s to keep, to keep cars from driving too much to use up the rubber not that we had any problem with gasoline in any in any real sense i'm you know, so if you wanted to go driving around America all the time in the middle of World War II, we had plenty of gas. They rationed it so you couldn't have plenty of gas, but the U.S. had plenty of oil and gas to feed everybody's war machine. It was much more of a problem of putting it on tankers to get it to, to England or to get it to China or wherever else they were trying to get gasoline to, um, or oil, um, but gasoline or oil because sometimes you, you want to ship it as, as gasoline to, if you want to put it you want to ship out aviation gasoline other times you want to ship out sort of semi-refined crude oil to go into um the steam bo boilers on ships so you, you're wanting to ship so you had much more problems um shipping the oil than than the idea of having enough oil but we didn't have enough um rubber so if people were driving around too much, especially with the tires in those days, they wear it out a lot faster than they do to do, do today. They didn't have enough rubber for tires, so they had to rate, they had to um, in the U.S. ration gasoline so that you um, don't have um, you, you know so you don't use up the rubber because it's hard to ration because you'd ration tires too, but people who drive around and then their tires would go pop and then what do they do and it causes problems but the u.s rationed a bunch of other items too mainly because they were trying to have all of the production go to war efforts or so much of it go to war efforts so the people um couldn't you know would overspend on stuff because they wanted it now and a lot of the women could you know um who had jobs could now spend it on whatever they wanted to so there was rationing to keep the prices from inflating so this is and people will put up at it and also particularly they did it in germany too i know but i know a little bit more about it in the u.s war bonds was a big thing one to get it was one to help pay for the um the war to keep instead of doing pure keynesian economics of pure print money print money print money just print money and don't tell anybody that you're 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 not you're getting money just from pinning it so it was partially to to pay for the stuff but it was also and then you get minor but paid out over many years interest you get the money back costs the government a little bit more it spreads out the cost the interest isn't that big of a problem it, it's a it's an issue but it's not that big of a problem but it was also to get money out of people's pockets 
You know, so it's patriotic to buy war bonds to support the war, and it, and it did that in a real sense. But it was also, if you're turning over, I don't know, half or three-quarters of your pay to war bonds, because if you're a single woman who didn't have a child and who could room with somebody else so you don't have much rent, and all you're really doing is paying for food and the clothing allotments are rationed, and so you don't have a lot of money to really spend on things. And it was the idea that you bought war bonds, that you would get this money back, you know, presumably if the U.S. won the war, and obviously we did. So you'd get all that money back. So it was, a, you know, theoretical risk on it. So you get your money back. So all that money you were earning was still going to be yours, but you could do it into war bonds. So it takes the money out of the economy. Okay, well, that people are willing to do in a war. But in peacetime in Germany, if you're going to build tanks and airplanes and whatever else, you're going to have a problem with this because you can see people weren't going to want um, rationing or price controls too heavily on, on products. Because even if you have price controls, well, the store shelves are going to, you know, it's going to be empty very quickly. And so you got to try to get the money out. So, but they could as much as they wanted to, except if a component or a raw material element needed to be imported. If you needed to import it, that's where Germany had trouble because nobody wanted Reich marks or not in any scale because nobody wanted to buy enough from Germany. Okay, we would give them supplies in exchange of money. Short, hungry, and Poland. So that's my little talk on economics and what's going on. Oh, I paused it for a reason because we've had a bunch of factories come due and we're going to have these guys because these guys are partially built into you and they've gotten a little cheaper to build. Okay, but we want to come here. And the reason, part of the reason I don't just, you know, hit plus, plus, plus is because we have this sort of uneven building um, product. Sometimes we can build more factories at once than other times. And I want to get these other factories that are partially built. Well, yours isn't even completed. The partially built ones, well, it's just going to be quicker to turn it this way to see. Um actually completed so that they're um, they don't forever hover as a unbuilt item and so they'll get into the mix there's gonna be some events that do this but it's sort of good to get these guys um, built before the events that are gonna come and spew in a bunch of um, more ICs because if I max out building to 10 ICs in this and then dump in two or three more by event they'll all be multiplied by whatever level that of these buildings we have so it's good to sort of do that now because of all of that we're going to put all of these down at the bottom we'll get to building these some days especially since most of these come in at least partially built few aren't few you got to fully do but get you the historic ships and there we go so now we have more slightly cheaper ICs in production so these guys obviously are much more built as Hayek said I think it was Hayek if socialists um, understood economics, they wouldn't be socialists. Yeah, and Kingsian, Keynesian economics. In the long run, we're all dead, true, but um, also in the long run, um, Keynesian policies don't work. Short term, they sort of kind of work. Because in, um, oh, what is it, Alfred Maynard Keynes, if I have that right? Um, yes, if you build a bridge across here, you know, pay, pay the government to build the, you know, the government pays for building the bridge. You employ a bunch of people, and once you get that bridge done, yes, um, up on both sides of the bridge up here, because otherwise you had to go all the way around. And it's, this is actually rather rough, rough water in here that isn't 
I mean, fairies can do it, but it but it ain't necessarily easy going all the time. Um, so um, you get an economic boom, particularly here because it was um, very underdeveloped. San Francisco is very highly developed, but still you get economic increase. So Keynesian pumping the prime, priming the pump, does work when you're actually doing it. But once you've built the bridge, and then you build one here, and you build one here, and you build a couple more, you know, once you get all these bridges built, there's no more bridges to build. It doesn't, you can't just, okay, we'll do this again and do this again. You can't constantly do the broken window theory by go around and break all the windows and will the um, glass manufacturers and the people that put in the windows um, are going to get jobs and then they're going to make money and then they're going to go and um, spend the money in a diner to, to eat lunch and then, then so then the waitress and the, the cook will get more money um, from tips and then they can go buy something else. You know, if, you do, if you just purely just break something to to make economic activity it sort of shows up and it's sort of taxed a little bit more but eventually there's diminishing returns and eventually you're going to run into a run into a problem with it but when you can do something that actually improves um basically reduces friction in a way but improves economic um activity like the internet and you get that going and which i'm making some of my living right now off the internet and you guys watching it but i can also um order computer parts online or i can see what's um the 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 store hours of a store that i want to go to without having to get on the phone and call them or look it up in the phone book i can just google that store see its hours and know if it's going to be open or not and just okay that's great and they're going to be open and I'm going to go over, and so you do stuff like that to to increase economic activity. The Keynes, and Keynes looks at some of this stuff and realizes that he does that this does do this, and so the government paying for some of this helps. But at some point, getting five percent or ten percent faster internet speed over California doesn't improve things. Now maybe going because um, I, because you guys remember me that have been around long enough, bitching and moaning about my slow internet. Yeah, it may be ten times faster improves things. You know, I, you know, there's going to be various hurdles that are going to get it, but just a five percent faster, a ten percent faster, you know, overall for everybody, that isn't going to necessarily improve things. So at some point, until you get a new, a new type of railroad, you know, not just railroads or high speed trains, but um, a hub, you know, a maglev railroad that can go really fast, but cheaply, energy-wise, move, you know, um, big heavy loads across America, but move it, um, or something, you know, something totally new. Until you get to that point again, a new plateau reached and going over, the Keynesian has, um, you know, once you build the rail, you know, so once you build the existing railroad, m putting a railroad into a super small, tiny town that doesn't doesn't need but one or two shipments a week of a big you know truck totally it doesn't do any good it just doesn't you know stops being any good so he understands that but he doesn't get yes um, yeah we're doing really good with energy so we'll do that and we'll help the fascists out, or the nationalists out so Keynes he and Keynes does understand but Keynes is I I don't know all about Keynes but um it isn't pure socialist kind of stuff. It's more of a, you know, government or other sorts of priming the pump element that a lot of socialists like. And so this is all the kind of stuff that I, I'm looking at and sort of studying with National Socialist Germany. Because Germany was a fairly well-developing country, but they also... God, and... Their... Um, no, I'm not going to use the word. Their slum areas in, like, Berlin and other places. A lot of the buildings... Or at least, well, okay, some of the buildings still exist. I don't, I don't know the percentage. Obviously, there's a lot of bombing going on. But there's modern day some of the buildings um and cause they have photo you know photos of the period before the nazis came to power you know, you know late 20s early 30s then the photos 
of the same building sort of um, with the Nazis in power and then video of the modern, you know, built the, the exact same building. You can tell it's the exact same building. And you can see lots of changes. And the pre-Nazi building had outhouses in the back of, say, a six or eight story building. So if you wanted to use the outhouse, you had to walk downstairs. And basically some of the people talking about living in it, it just was um, an open sewer that you're sort of walking through to get out there, meaning it was wet and um, whatnot from all these people using it and it just couldn't handle it. And the building today has been plumbed. You know, so you have, you know, flush toilets in the apartments. And also the big thing is, and the, which the Nazis still use these buildings, is that like um, living, the, the number of people went down to like only like 20 or maybe even 10% of the size of the building. So you'd have, you know, in a, what, you know, in a small sort of one room area, six person family or something live literally like in a one room um, slum area. And then after the Nazis came and kicked all the slum people out, Two, because the Nazis did, didn't march in there, unlike, say, communists or other people. They just didn't march in there and beat up all the people and told them to go. No, they went and built new... Because, and again, I'll say this. None of the good stuff that the Nazis did, either on purpose or by accident, in any way justifies or excuses the evil that they did. But not every action they did was in and of itself evil. There was a huge movement to build good new tenement, you know, apartment-type buildings, as well as sort of standalone homes, model neighborhoods. They were building all this kind of stuff. Now, of course, it was only available to the right type of people, Aryans, non-communists, non, non you know, if you were part of the, you were part of the wrong types of people, man, you weren't getting any of this stuff. But if you were the right types of people, if you were going, following the Nazi program, it was a, you know, and if you liked what they were doing, it was a good system, you know, for you to experience. Not necessarily a, a good system, but a good system to experience. Because you went from this hugely overcrowded um, tenement building to a modern, with modern convenience ones. And wow, and so they were really working to move this people to this stuff. And then once, you know, they cleared out the building, then they went in and re-renovated the building. And, you know, now you're going into a two or three room apartment with a you know, a family of four or something. Uh, and so, um, you know, instead of a one-room apartment, a four-room or two- or three-room apartment or whatever. So it was much larger spaces, and you had indoor plumbing for bathrooms and all this kind of, you know, each, each apartment had its own, you know, toilet or whatever. I don't know the details of each of these projects. But so they were taking these god-awful places and making li livable. So they were doing a lot of that kind of stuff. And so they cleaned up a lot of that. So people, you know, and so I'm looking at this kind of stuff. And so they're priming the pump by government sponsored and of various ways. And it gets a little murky for me, whether because some of them I definitely know are factory villages. So the factories that are building things, often non-war related that may later get converted to war use, that are building model um, housing you know, near their factory. So it was easy to work and easy to go to the factory. So some of them were, you know, enterprise stuff. And others were um, funded by the government at one level, where it's the GAO or the national, I, you know. So some of the stuff was publicly funded. But once you've got everybody housed, you know, once, you, you know, once you've gone through this transition, well, all of the bricklayers and carpenters and whatever are going to be out of work. Now, you don't decide to, oh, well, let's just clear the people out and we'll fly a bomber over to bomb this and then we'll have to rebuild it. You see, you, you, you see at some point, that Keynesian element ends. And you can talk and there's very good reasons and there's better arguments if you manage it to instead of doing it in Keynesian is to do it the capitalist way by going, oh, all these poor people that live in this shitty building that's literally shitty, um... Let's get them a good jobs so that they'll wave money out the window and say, I'll pay better rent if you better build a better building for me. That's the capitalist way. Instead of having the government build the new and specify what the new things is, is you just get the people making money and they wave it out the window and say, get me the hell out of here. I can pay better rent if you build me a better home. And yes, if you look at um, Britain... The London Underground was built as a private, and multiple, and actually competing, and there's some really good 
documentaries that, uh, that I've seen as pure private enterprise, pure non-government supported private enterprises. Eventually, because of and it's actually they were building competing tunnels, competing with each other, and there was all kinds of stuff. Eventually, it does get organized in, and but I can see again infrastructure being paid for collectively. But again, how far do you go? Simply because everybody's been paying an extra two percent to improve London in infrastructure, do you just keep building more infrastructure? You know, in the sense of, you build it, they'll come. It's like, we'll put in this new underground line, and once we do that, people will start flocking to those things. and start. The government continues and bureaucracies continue to justify their own existence by, you know, by wanting to expand and do it instead of saying, oh, hey, yep, we built it all down. Um, reduce taxes because, at least for now and for the next 20 years, we, we can't foresee needing any more underground things but we still need maintenance you know and there's some of we're getting some of that from fees people using it but we don't need any new major construction and we don't need any of this major stuff so reduce the taxes down maybe keep you know go down to only 10 or 20 percent for this and give the money back to the people or let them keep their own money as you should say no government doesn't work that way and that's sort of the problem so you can do it the capitalist way and get the same ultimate end results Sometimes, often, it depends on the situation, because sometimes, obviously, you have Great Depressions and other things like that, and wars and famines and revolutions. But often, you can get better results quicker, cheaper with the capitalist system, but not always. Okay, advanced education investment, or advanced whatever. Um, Basically, in the modern sense, go to where you learn that all everything I'm saying is entirely wrong. Because that's what the professor... Okay, um... Let's find another 37 technology here to do, which will be these two. Because they will be... Keynesian... Ke Ke Keynes didn't go far enough, and we need full communist control, and... People like Gamer are 100% wrong. Okay, the the Eighth Party Congress rally for honor. And again, someday I want to do these up, and they would be like a six-eight event chain someday. But when I was building, okay, and we'll get gain four industrial capacity, and we hurt our relations with the Soviet Union to get some other propaganda effects. But the reason I have I didn't do those. Quite honestly, I haven't made any of this because Black Ice already did, and it wasn't the highest priority for me to do. You know, it's my higher priorities are to do things that Black Ice didn't cover. So that's some of the, the focus I was working with. Okay, mobile unit combined arms, and that's pushing something too far, or something is now too far advanced. Um, yeah, well, probably mobile unit combined arms, but... Um, oh, is that the... I guess just education advance kicked in, so we now have more. Okay, um... Well, we're still in 36, so we're getting towards the end. So more 37... And twin engine armament research. So we can start doing twin engine fighter prototypes. Um, oh, we can still do even more. So, um, medium fuel tank. And so, yes, there are people that heavily disagree with me. The reason we're not getting any money is because we zeroed out in the interrupted our production or our sales of of supplies so yes now we're back to a positive gain Ecuador yeah some of the problems with going negative and yeah I'm gonna up this again um, pause Get on top here. Okay, 97. Yeah, that's that's good enough. We're, we're gonna leave that there. I want to build that up. 
Okay, um, Baratanu meeting, um, that's that guy. On the 16th of September, 1936, Romanian political um, George Britenu uh, met the Führer Adolf Hitler in Berlin. Should we make um, should we make the offer that Germany will supply Romania with weapons and will guarantee their borders in exchange? They will strengthen our commercial ties and not allow the Soviets to enter their territory. Okay. Obviously, there's, um, you know, the, uh, you know, um, various political people are traveling around and meeting with other leaders of various times. Romania monarchy had been, um, or were they, the, the monarchy that, that gets to be the Romanian monarchy or German, German rent to princes, basically, that's what Romania gets, Greece gets, and a few other people gets. Um, so the the monarchs had been fairly pro um, leading up to World War One, Germany, but the people of Romania, and this is the reason I know this is sort of George here, is because I've learned um, again from Vlad Virgil, um, nine, uh, ninety-six stuff, that a lot of Romanian is just simply, oddly, as I would say, weirdly um, spelled Latin because they really are sort of have this fairly. The fairly tradition of trying to be Western and Latin a lot more than, especially growing up, um, you know, with that all being deep behind the Iron Curtain. To me, that was all weird and unknown to us. So they, but they really looked towards um, uh, culturally France, particularly, but also Italy, and that's what they really sort of looked towards to as a people, not towards Germany. So in World War One, the the people basically forced Romania to go onto the the Allies' side. Where the monarchy had sort of emotionally and wanted to be on the, the Entente side, um, no, not the Entente, um, the Central Powers side. I'm not going to call it the World War Two um, term. So now Romania has been going back and forth, and I don't know all the details for while they were fascist, and then um, Cordenu gets kicked out or dies or whatever, or kicked out and dies. I don't know. So they've been going back and forth. They would like to be, again, because of World War I and such, allied with Britain and France. And they're buying, you can look and see a lot of, um, in their parades, um, French and Italian tanks and aircraft and other things like that. So they're really trying to model themselves on Britain or on France and Italy's army and trying to do that as an alliance. But Germany's, you know, Hitler is like, hey, I hate the Soviet Union, and this is another country. We also hate Poland, and we want to get rid of Poland entirely, too. But Romania doesn't have to disappear, and if they're going to be a good, strong nation, you know, you come on our side, and we'll protect you. So we can make the offer, and we can. You can decide not to, but um, you can make the offer. Now, um, if you're met with the Romanian politician, George Bratanu in Berlin on that. Uh, he offered a very favorable deal, German military equipment um, for bilateral communal relations. Basically, a lot of that commercial relations was, of course, oil and take Reichsmarks for the oil and whatnot, as well as paying paying for the oil and, and weaponry. Um, the assurance of the Soviet troops would not be allowed to transit their territory. Basically, you know, a defense pact of the Soviets attack. We're in on the full Romanian politicians decline your position. Now, um, you may think this is odd, but the way I coded this was, Romania will always decline your offer. Now, why did I even bother making this? Well, one, for immersion, you know, so you get the chance to make the offer that Hitler made. But two, if the Romanian player is um, human, not the AI, the human can decide to join you, which um, puts you on the path of getting them into the Axis. So the human, can, a human can join, but the AI because it's based on the pol those politicians, um, will always turn you down for the the offer. But so I, I do sort of think of these things. So if we were playing a big mega game and had somebody playing Romania, they could go, they can make the decision. Do we want to try to do the French-British alliance? And, or do we want to try to do, you know, alliance with Germany or whatnot? Okay, cruiser fire control systems have improved. Great. Um, we're going to let those go because that's just a 34 tech. And military police have advanced. I th 
think that's this one, 37. We'll see about moving it to uh, some air. Um, we'll wait on those till 37, I think, unless I just come up dry on everything else. Oh, we'll do this. We'll go for that. Okay, and on this point, I think we're going to end the episode. I want to thank everyone for watching. I want to thank you for liking the videos. It does help visibility on YouTube. And, of course, please post questions, comments, suggestions, ideas, corrections. If I'm getting stuff wrong, please correct me. Um, again, I say the stuff I put into the events, I research. I try to make it as historical as possible. And, obviously, if I'm reading those, um, I'm giving you a good history. But other stuff may, that I'm relating to may be a bit off, so I'm happy to have you correct me. So, see you next time for more Hearts of Iron.